Up next. This is a story of my life as a defenseless woman in the Navy. A naval officer alleges a cover-up and threatens to go public. Very soon, I'll have enough evidence. Send in the media, and then something will be done. But before that can happen, she's murdered, some say, by the man she named as her rapist. And I start suspecting that something is missed, that this may be all a setup. Can forensic science separate fact from fiction? The videotape is startling. It is scary. She is foretelling her own death. After a long, stressful day working as an air traffic controller at one of the largest naval jet bases in the world, Elise McDessie went to dinner with her husband at an Italian restaurant in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Eddie McDessie worked in the computer business. He did a lot of contract work, and some of it was for the U.S. Navy, and that is when he met Elise McDessie. Sometime after 9 p.m., when the couple returned home from dinner, someone was waiting for them. When Eddie regained consciousness, his hands were bound behind his back. He saw his wife tied to the bed and the man raping and stabbing her. Somehow, Eddie managed to free his hands, grab the handgun he kept in the nightstand, and shot the assailant. Then he called 911. <laughs> But the intruder wasn't dead. The assailant leaped up, lunged towards him with the knife, and Eddie shot the individual again. When paramedics arrived, Elise was barely alive. Her dress had been pulled up, and her pantyhose had been ripped. She had multiple stab wounds to the chest, and her throat had been cut ear to ear. She's trying to talk. They absolutely believe she was trying to communicate and could never get the words out. And before anybody could really give her any significant help, she died on the way to the hospital. The assailant was identified by his driver's license as 37-year-old Quincy Brown. He was laying with his legs pinned underneath him, laying on his back, and he had three gunshot wounds to the chest. Brown was one of Elise's co-workers at the Oceana Naval Air Base. Quincy Brown, military man, worked at the same command where Elise worked. So it wasn't a random crime. Something happened to bring co-workers into the same room, and neither one of them left alive. Elise's husband, Eddie, was treated for his head injury and released. As incredible as Eddie's story seemed, evidence at the scene appeared to support it. The entranceway floor was littered with takeaway containers of leftover food from the restaurant. Electrical cords used to tie Eddie's hands were on the bedroom floor. Underneath the intruder's right hand was the knife used in Elise's murder. And Eddie gave police a videotape that Elise made before her death. It contained some shocking allegations against her superiors in the Navy, allegations that perhaps the Navy didn't want to be made public. Elise and Eddie McDessie had been married for only five years at the time of Elise's murder. They lived in an apartment off the military base and had no children. Elise enjoyed being in the Navy. She was looking forward to her future as an air traffic controller. Tough job, and especially for females, and she would have been good at it if she had had more time. Quincy Brown, the man found shot to death in the McDessie's bedroom, had no history of violence. Quincy had been in the Navy for over 19 years. He was married, he had a child. Um, he did not have any kind of criminal background. Quincy Brown worked with Elise at the Naval Air Base. Everybody that we talked to that knew Quincy Brown that didn't go with his character at all. It seemed to be completely conflict of his character. But the facts were undeniable. A rape test kit on Elise McDessie showed signs of sexual intercourse, and the biological evidence matched Quincy Brown's DNA. A knife covered with Elise's blood was found underneath Brown's body. 
But what drove Brown to murder? Eddie McDessey thought he knew why. He said his wife made a videotape before her murder, and he gave it to the authorities. Sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape. This is a story of my life as a defenseless woman in the Navy. The videotape Elise McDessey made is more perplexing to me than anything I've run into in 20 years of covering crime. It is startling. It is scary. You see a woman who is speaking from the grave. Elise described a tale of horror. She alleged sexual abuse covered up at the highest levels of the Navy. Three weeks later, I have to try my best to avoid his sexual harassment. I got raped in the woman's bathroom. And he again threatened me and told me, you can't prove anything, so keep your mouth shut, or else you and your husband can't get hurt. It's a confession of sorts, like a diary. It's almost a video diary of all these terrible things happening to her. I have made a list of names and placed it in a safe deposit box in my name only. Police used a court order to get Elise's journal. Quincy Brown had been named in her journal as one of those attackers. Elise listed all five men who she claimed raped her while on duty. At this point, we knew we needed to get the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, NCIS, involved, because obviously now we had two of their members dead. The NCIS questioned the four other men Elise accused in her journal. They all denied the allegations. She had accused four of the best guys I've ever known, the best guys I've ever worked with, family men, really decent, respectable guys. Nancy Simpson was Elise's friend, as well as one of her supervisors. I knew that it was a bunch of crap. Elise never told me that she had been sexually harassed at work. If that had happened, she certainly would have told me. It would have never been covered up. But Eddie McDessey was outraged. To him, the evidence was clear. Eddie believes that Quincy Brown went there to shut her up and to make her stop talking about what was going on at the base. Eddie has also said that Quincy was part of a larger conspiracy involving higher Navy forces to keep her quiet. As proof, Eddie pointed out that Elise had recently been demoted at the Navy base. Eddie claims in retaliation for her sexual harassment claims. Eddie says they really slowed down her training, reassigned her because of it. He said that she was the victim not only of the harassers, but of the same superiors that she'd confided in. Then, investigators noticed small inconsistencies in Eddie's story. According to Quincy Brown's cell phone records, he called the McDessey's apartment at 9.36 on the night of the murders, which was after Eddie claimed they were assaulted at the door of their apartment. The call lasted two minutes and 10 seconds. It's out of the ordinary that somebody's gonna call and then come over and, and rape someone and kill them. The knife found under Quincy Brown's hand, the one used to kill Elise McDessey, didn't contain Brown's fingerprints, and his shirt didn't have Elise's blood. Quincy gets none of Elise's blood on his body. How in the world could he have done this and not had any of Elise's blood on him? And on the night before her murder, Elise McDessey bought the gun used to kill Quincy Brown in a sporting goods store in Virginia. Then I start suspecting something is missed. This may be all a setup. But who wanted both Elise McDessey and Quincy Brown dead? And why? In this video journal made shortly before her death, Elise McDessey claimed she had been raped and sexually assaulted by five co-workers at the Oceana Naval Air Base. On the tape, she claimed she reported these incidents to her superiors and had been ignored, so she threatened to go public. Very soon, I'll have enough evidence to send to the media, and then something will be done. But 
but the Navy denied Elise McDessie ever filed one single claim, let alone five. I was her superior, and my immediate superior was a very tough female, tougher than me. There was no word of this. Nothing was ever reported to any of us, and either one of us would have acted immediately. One of the men Elise named in her journal was Quincy Brown, the man found shot to death in her apartment. Elise's husband, Eddie, claimed Brown knocked him unconscious and murdered Elise to stop her from going public with these allegations. Investigators weren't so sure. To find the truth, investigators started with the only hard evidence they had, the crime scene. We wanted fresh eyes, somebody to really tell us something that we weren't able to see. Virginia Beach Police contacted Ross Gardner, a nationally recognized crime scene analyst. This was a very complex crime scene, and it wasn't until we got a lot of the DNA information back that we were able to make sense of it. But certain aspects of the crime scene analysis certainly supported Eddie's statement. But then Gardner looked more closely at the crime scene photos and noticed that they contradicted Eddie's story. The autopsy showed that the first shot penetrated Quincy's heart. This creates arterial spurts, high pressure ejections of blood from the body, and they are easily identified. Because the blood is ejecting out in a stream, it breaks up into larger masses. And so what we see in an arterial spur are very large elliptical shaped stains. Eddie said, when he saw his wife being attacked, he grabbed a gun from the nightstand and shot Quincy Brown as he rushed towards him. <coughs> Yet, the blood spatter evidence and the crime scene photos showed that Quincy Brown was facing in the opposite direction. There is no evidence whatsoever that suggests that Quincy was ever standing when that wound was ejecting blood or that he was ever facing back towards the nightstand. The void in the arterial spurts on the carpet tell us that Quincy was in this kneeling position at the time of the first shot and that his physical position never altered other than to lay back. Investigators now had a theory that Eddie McDessie was involved in an elaborate scheme. First, he convinced his wife to make the videotape and written journal, accusing her five co-workers of rape and sexual assault. Their plan was to file a lawsuit against the Navy. Eddie McDessie told several people that this sexual harassment with his wife in the Navy would be bigger than tailhook, referring to another civil suit in which someone collected a lot of money from, from the Navy. And Elise, was a willing participant in the scheme. It was obvious that they had a plan in action. It would appear that there may have been some partnership between Eddie and Elise as far as setting this thing up. They planned to prove their case by luring one of the men she named in her journal, Quincy Brown, to their apartment to have unprotected sex with her, and then claim it was yet another rape, only this time they'd have DNA evidence to prove it. Quincy did not force his way into that apartment. He came there willingly. He had sex with Elise willingly. Investigators believe Eddie planned to kill Quincy after the sexual act was complete in order to silence him. It's not clear whether Elise was aware of this or not. Elise and Eddie bought the gun in Hampton, Virginia, the night before this event occurred. I don't know if Elise had planned that Quincy would die. I don't know. But why did Eddie kill his wife? Eddie McDessie had taken out a half a million dollar life insurance policy on his wife. This was less than 30 days prior to the incident. That's a lot of money to have in a life insurance policy for a sailor who has no family fortune, is not earning but a low rate in the Navy, not making much money. This, plus an additional $200,000 from her Navy life insurance, was a significant payout. The seven deadly sins, greed is my favorite. And this man loved his money, and he was willing to sacrifice innocent people for $700,000.
so he could live the good life. And he could pin her murder on Quincy Brown. He's a cold-blooded killer. Ironically, Elise helped plan, organize, and carry out her own murder. The only thing that changed is Elise was double-crossed and she was killed in the process as well. Eddie's plan was almost too perfect. <clears throat> Based on the forensic evidence, prosecutors believe that Eddie McDessey was responsible for the murders of both his wife, Elise, and Quincy Brown. They believe this whole thing started as a sexual harassment scam against the Navy. Elise McDessey made a videotape and written journal claiming that five men sexually assaulted and raped her while on duty at the naval air base where she worked. Despite her claims on the tape, the Navy says she never filed any charges against these men. Sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape. But Eddie and Elise needed forensic evidence. So they invited one of the men she named in her journal, Quincy Brown, over to their apartment for a sexual threesome. Elise would have claimed that Quincy had raped her, and therefore they would have been able to pursue their sexual harassment claim. On the night of the crime, there was no assault outside their apartment. When they returned home from dinner, Quincy Brown called their apartment at 9.36, most likely to confirm their date. Hello? Are we still on for tonight? He said he'll be here in 15 minutes. Okay. Let's get Investigators ready. believe Eddie set the scene by tying Elise to the bed. To Quincy Brown, it would appear to be a bondage fantasy for the evening. To the police, it would look like a violent assault. <laughs> when Quincy arrived, he had a condom in his pocket. Perhaps he was encouraged not to use it, although no one really knows. Go ahead on it. I'm just gonna kick back and watch. After the sexual encounter, Eddie pulled his first double cross of the evening on Quincy Brown. Okay, I think you're finished. Break into my house, knock me out, you raped my wife. They'd blame him for breaking into the apartment and raping Elise. It's unclear whether Elise knew if Quincy would die. Cut me loose now, Eddie. But she obviously didn't know Eddie would double cross her, too. Eddie staged the scene to make it look like a break-in, assault, and a rape murder perpetrated by Quincy Brown. And Eddie collects $700,000 in life insurance. And maybe he walks away with a sexual harassment case also. He almost got away with it too, but in the end, he left too many clues. It was obvious that Eddie McDessie was lying to me about what had happened and how things had happened in, in that bedroom. He told us this happened, this happened, this happened. And multiple claims by Eddie McDessie were refuted by the forensic evidence. But when it came time to arrest Eddie McDessie, he had fled to Russia. The problem we're having is that he's now a Russian citizen, and we don't have an extradition treaty, so I can't get him out of Russia. For almost a decade, Eddie McDessie was on the run. Reporter Mike Mather decided to track him down, despite everyone telling him it was useless. The State Department at the time told me, Virginia Beach Police told me, the embassy told me, you're wasting your time. He's never coming back here. So I said, let's go find out. Sent him an email. He agreed to meet with me. Flew to Moscow. Apparently, Mike Mather caught McDessey at just the right time. He clearly didn't like living in Russia. How can I say this? They, they took my money, they beat me up, they put me in jail because they thought I was an American spy. And here I was without American documents to prove that I'm an American. McDessey chose to return to the United States and face trial, thinking that Elise's videotaped allegations would provide the reasonable doubt he needed for acquittal. 
I want to do that because I know I can prove I'm innocent. I know that what has happened to me and all this that happened to me, should, the American people should know about. 14 years after the double homicide, Eddie McDessie went on trial. The forensic evidence was overwhelming. Would the jury find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder of Quincy B. Brown, guilty of first-degree murder of Elise M. McDessie? McDessie was sentenced to two consecutive life terms. Ross explained very, very well how the blood spatter evidence contradicted what Eddie said. It wasn't he said, she said, it was he said and everyone else was dead. It's never left me that Eddie did that, and I've never questioned that he was capable of it, not even for a second. Without the forensic evidence, without Ross Gardner and the blood spatter uh, analysis of the crime scene, to be able to disprove Eddie's statement, because all we had was Eddie's statement and the crime scene. And he had a good story. 